I'm Alex Seropian, Project Director on Stubbs. I am Matt Sell, writer for Stubbs. Ted, let's talk about where the idea for the game came from. Well, uh, we were all trying to come up with game ideas, and no one had any good ones. Mine were the worst of all. And I remember walking around one day, uh, my house just being sort of despondent that I hadn't come up with anything good, and I was trying to come up with a good action idea, and I thought, oh, What's a, where does action in games come from? You know, uh, you know, people running around, chaos in the streets, cats and dogs lying together, the dead crawling out of their graves. Hey! <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it, it seemed pretty obvious that uh, it was about time for a game where you could play a dead guy and have him eat a bunch of brains. And so that's, in short, where the idea came from. So we're sitting around with, with uh, probably a few dozen like game ideas written up in, on one page a piece. And, uh, and yeah, so we started talking about what if you were the zombie? Yeah, we actually had a, we had a vote. I remember we had a big meeting and there was a vote. And this was the only idea that everybody seemed to vote for. Well, it was like, you know, Top five, everybody had their top five. Right, right. Well, we all, I, we actually, we picked three. And this was the one that I think... Was in common. On the yeah, list. it was one thing that seemed to keep popping up. There were a few other strong contenders, too. Yeah, it just barely beat out that game idea, which was all stick figures. Just barely. <laughs> one of the cool ideas uh, what we had at the beginning, which stuck, was the idea that it takes place over the course of just one day. Yes. Yeah, starts in the morning, ends at night. And uh, it's kind of cool how it's all cyclic, where you, you start right here in, in front of the, in the, in the, the main drag, downtown punch bowl, and it ends right here. That's true. Yeah, it was uh, almost planned that way. Yeah, there's lots of bookends like that. Uh, I wonder how many people will actually discover them. Hmm. I wonder if there's a prize for people to discover <laughs> nah, nah, probably not. Well, people could just feel good about themselves for doing it. There's a, f a few big design challenges that we started trying to tackle at the beginning. One was um, creating the world, this sort of retro futuristic, you know, engineered city of the 50s. And uh, our strategy there was to put in lots of robots and hovering cars and shiny stuff, things with, that looked like it came out of a World's Fair. And we also tried, I mean, I, I remember looking up, trying to research stores and stuff from the 50s, trying to get a decent feel for what cities were actually like then and what someone in that era would want when they built a city of the future. Yeah, there was this great artist, uh, his name was uh, Raidbaugh, who, who drew all these, he was, he was doing like this crazy art back in the 50s and 60s and it was, he had this whole series under the, the heading of um, the future we were promised, which was, was sort of inspirational for like our monorail and uh, you know so other elements of the of the city. We got a lot of inspiration out of looking at um, architecture that was built for the World's Fairs too. Yeah, you would be surprised at how much research we did for a game about a dead guy who runs around <laughs> eating brains. Yeah, we we uh, we got all these cool books that were um, had all these ads that were done in the fifties. Man, there was some funny shit in there, like uh, this cigarette ad. What oh, was yeah. that one? The 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 baby with the the look on its face. The baby's just done something horribly wrong, and he's looking up at mom with the big puppy dog eyes, and he says, "Yeah, before you strike me, mom, strike up a lucky strike or something like that." It was <laughs> something something really awful. Uh, yeah, it's like, yeah. Come on, mom, have a cig. Yeah. Chill out. It's better than sorry, abusing me. <laughs> sorry for playing ball in the house. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. And then I remember we we bought this uh, stack of uh, like Life magazines and Time magazines from the fifties. And when they showed up, they were like completely covered with mold. So we had to stick them in the other room. We had we had to stick them on the other side of the office in an opened window. Yeah. What, uh, whatever happened to those? <laughs> I think they fell out. <laughs> For all you trivia buffs out there, uh, my, my direction to Amy Warren, the actress who played Guidebot, was Carol Channing on meth. 
I think she did an excellent job. Nailed that one. But yeah, that was another idea we had sort of early on, which was civilians as power-ups. So all the civilians, you can, you can eat in one bite. And they're not just power-ups. They, they go from, they're the only power-up that keeps on giving. Because <laughs> you eat their brain and they turn into your pal. That was the other, there were, there were a few big ideas for stubs that were present right from the very start. Um, one of them was the idea of conversion that you would, that your goal would ultimately be to subjugate and conquer the city by converting as many of its citizens uh, into zombies as you could. And uh, the other big idea, I think, was possession, which is sort of similar in that you would be able to uh, use other people's abilities by possessing them somehow to compensate for one of Stubbs's deficiencies, like he can't get into a certain area or he doesn't have a bazooka or right. whatever it is. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I remember recently going back and looking at that one pager we had almost two years ago and a lot of the design ideas that were in there stuck. Yeah, Stubbs changed a lot. The character of Stubbs and uh, everything he's doing, the people he's fighting. We went through, I don't know how many different attacks on that idea before we found something that we could live with. Yeah, man, it was amazing how many concepts we went through just on the look of Stubbs. That was a long, drawn out, painful at times process. Yeah because I, I think we all sort of had some idea of what we wanted and it was just very difficult to get that look. Which is weird because it's a, uh, to look at Stubbs you would not necessarily think that every detail was painstakingly rendered, but yet we went through probably hundreds of iterations of Stubbs before we got to that point. What were some of the, uh, I remember having this conversation where we were trying to get inspiration for what it would look like by thinking about like what actors he looks like and stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> that who was, was, on, who that, was on that list? That, that was a very interesting I list. Buscemi yeah. was on that the, list. Steve Buscemi was there, uh, Tom Waits was there. Tom Waits, that's right. And uh, oh, the <laughs> Don Knotts. <laughs> Someone suggested Don Knotts. Alan. Alan suggested Don Knotts. Well, you can see a little Don Knotts in there's, them. There's a little bit of Don Knotts in everyone, and Stubbs is no exception. <laughs> All right, we're here at the greenhouse. Fabulous. Uh, I'm Patrick Curry, the lead designer on Stubbs. I am Matt Sell, the writer for Stubbs. And uh, this is a level that Matt and I uh, kind of did together. Um, Matt did the initial write-up uh, for the level, and had a bunch of cool ideas about what the various environments would be in it and then uh, I took that and translated it to uh, the world you're seeing in front of you now. I wanted to do a, a level where it was uh, sort of like the second level of another famous game I probably shouldn't mention by name uh, where you were running around in big verdant hills and stuff and I thought it might be cool if we uh, did that all indoors and a greenhouse seemed like the obvious thing to do, uh, especially in Punch Bowl where everything's all futuristic and you know they grow all the food for Punch Bowl here. And uh, that was the, the start of it. Yeah, the, uh, the initial write-up for the greenhouse had uh, three or four distinct areas, each That's one right. with their own kind of vegetation. And um, just through the process of making the game and getting it done, that, that got whittled down to two and a half um, the, the first area is uh, the large, hilly, outdoorsy area where we introduced the first drivable vehicle of the game, which Matt promptly na aptly it's, named. It's the Sodomobile. Of course it is. It's for people who tend the sod, of course. I, I can't imagine any other interpretation of that name. And uh, I don't know what you're thinking, Patrick. I, I don't, me either, most of the time. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the second half of the level, uh, or I guess second two-thirds, takes place in what we kind of called the, the moon sci-fi area. And this is 
where the experimental plants were grown. And those, you might notice the experimental plants kind of like weeds, they ended up growing through the entire level. But uh, that's because there were some really cool concepts done and uh, we liked them a lot, so we put them all over the level. Yeah, the, v the very first original concept was that uh, Stubbs was actually going to fight some of those plants. Some of those plants would be sentient. Uh, you have no idea how hard it is to make a sentient plant in the Halo engine. And once you've done that, how hard it is to keep it from killing you in real life. So we took them out for the benefit of all you people out there at home. That's right. It's for humanity. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you can thank us by buying more copies of Stubbs and Zombie. <laughs>
we're here to talk about the level that we lovingly know as the police station. Um, it's interesting because it's one of the very first levels that we got functional for the game and from it a lot of the other um, basic gameplays that got enhanced throughout the rest of the game came out of this, out of this level. Everything that you are expected to know how to do, you pretty much are, are learning it by this level in the game. Yep. This is Patrick Curry. I'm the lead designer. And um, like Alan said, everything except for the head in terms of abilities you have by now. And uh, like Alan said, it was the first one that we ever did. So we were kind of learning as we went with the police station, figuring out, hey, how is Stubbs going to work? How are the enemies going to work? How are the zombies going to work? Uh, how's this crazy hand thing going to work? And so we, we tried to uh, make a level that was conducive to teaching that to the player and, uh, you know, still being fun. Right, right. And uh, what's also interesting about that is that the first thing that was really working in this level in terms of gameplay was the hand in the detention area. It started out as a, as a paper project where we were moving upwards from the first floor um, to the detention area and then to the... Uh, the dance battle and wound up working at it from the middle outwards. So the, uh, the tension level got, and that whole hand bit um, got done. And originally it was only one path, right? Um, you went and got one of the lieutenants right. and walked, you know, this long, arduous, very boring path. And uh, over time, that whole process got more and more convoluted and became one of, the more, one of my more favorite portions of the game. There's so many different ways to pull that off that uh, you, know, you, you can go through it and do it and play it differently each time. Yeah, one of the reasons that the police station ended up being one of the first levels that got done is the, the first game that we ever took screenshots from, or first level that we ever took screenshots of. It was the first level that we ever showed to the press. Uh, we showed it behind closed doors on a press tour and then we showed an enhanced version of it at. Uh, at the game developer conference. And it's good, you know, you always need a level um, to, to figure things out and doing a level that's kind of in the middle of the game uh, is handy because you don't have to teach the player every little thing by then, um, but you want to kind of feel like, hey, it's the middle of the game and the player's having fun and this is working. It's not too easy, it's right. not too hard. Right, it's, it's all about getting that core, <clears throat> that core functionality working as opposed to working first on the first level or the last level because those two levels are always going to be the exceptions to the rule and not the rule themselves. And this, this, this level does a pretty good job of, of being the rule. What I also like about um, Police Station that came out pretty well is that each sta stage of it builds slowly and then caps off with, with a very you know, impacting, um, drawn out boss type battle. But it, it's a situational boss as opposed to a um, you know, a big guy that you have to beat down. It's just a, you have to over, overwhelm and overcome. And um, I found that after I got those working, I went back to my, uh, some of my other levels and made them do a lot, of, a lot of the same things that really worked in this level. Yeah, they kind of became the prototypes, like the, the kind of king of the hill type battle in what we call the muster room before Stubbs is captured. Right. Turned out really well, it's really fun. And then what we call the gauntlet, which is uh, right before the, uh, the end of the level where Stubbs has to get through the super long hallway with guys coming in from either side. Um, both of those turned out really fun and are kind of signature moments in the game. Hi, this is Alan Turner, um, game designer here at White Load, and we're talking about um, the mall. Hi, I'm Aaron, and I'm a artist working for Wide Load. And we're talking about the mall. So, uh, yeah, this is A50 Mall, and th th this is another one of the early um, levels that, got, that we started working on. There is, the, the police station was the first one we got functional, but the mall um, was probably one of the first ones we, um, we started building just to get the, uh, the idea of what physical spaces should feel like um, when you're outside with stubs and what worked, what didn't work what the engine could handle, what we couldn't handle, how, how much of a cityscape we could pull off uh, within the limits of the Halo 1 um, engine. Yeah. I think we, we did a pretty good job. Yeah, this is actually the, my favorite level to play through right now. Good job, Alan. 
Oh, well, oh, good job, Aaron, since you're the one who made it look good. Oh, cool. I didn't really do that much, just those gold curves that you see. All right, so um, what, this is actually one of my favorite levels, too. What I like about it is, like uh, the police station, you've got more than one way to, uh, to get to where I want you to go. You know, I, I believe when I watch people play it, most people tend to, to hang off and run to the left, but you can also run down the right. And you get a, a slightly different experience when you go down the right. Um, there's, and when you play at co-op, doing both of those things uh, with, with players throwing hands, possessing people, going all over the place, having guys in the overpass, having guys underneath, the whole thing just is crazy cool. Yeah, I really like right here how you can get a whole horde of zombies, and when you go into the garage, and like you look back at them through the, you'll see them all start to, that guy has an axe. <laughs> Why does he have an axe? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so. Well, what was also neat about this was that um, in the early incarnations of it, you could see from inside the mall out to the streets. And it, well, when, when it goes, was it, it was supposed to be one of these old school um, concrete malls where you could walk around, look, look outside, um, and you know, fall to your death if you weren't careful. And what we found was that as cool an idea as that was, it just was turning out to be not very practical frame rate, ri frame rate wise um, for the engine. And when we were pulling hair trying to figure out a good way to make, make that, make it still look like a mall on the inside. And we, what we wound up doing was putting in these snazzy um, windows that are kind of like, uh, they're kind of, uh, they, they're, they're collision barriers. They're, they're not really windows, but they have this neat flare. I don't know if you can tell us more yeah. how that works. Well, it, what's, what's great about it is that before the frame rate was like five frames per second, so you could see outside and it was drawing everything. And then, uh, you know, it just, it just looked like a regular park, uh, parking garage with like, you know, the, without the, the little haze. We couldn't get the haze in there until we put this. If you look closely at the windows, there's like this white little haze coming off. And I think it actually made the game, you know, it made it look like creepier, you know. Right, it did. It, it, it has this sort of old school yeah. film grain bloom yeah, that, environment. that uh, makes it, it, it actually is weird because it actually makes the insides feel bigger now that that's closed off, where before yeah. it felt kind of small and cramped. There, um, the other things that was neat about this was that it was an opportunity to play around with various ideas on choke points. Um, one of the first ones you encounter is when you're going through the overpass and you get, you get the ability to use your head. Um, there's a mob of riot cops, and then at the elevator there's this mob of lieutenant cops and beat cops and taser cops. And up until that point, there's just kind of the, there's this slow build, and it doesn't ever really get too intensive. But when you hit that point, it's, it, it brings you to a screeching halt. So if you are trying to charge through the level, you hit there and suddenly you have to fight. And it's a pretty tough fight. If you, if you play this on insane, it's... It's pretty insane. I usually let my zombies do all the work for me there. Just hang back. Yeah, yeah this is great to see it in, um, when you play it in easy. And a little bit on normal, but more so in easy, where you can really build up a nice sizable zombie horde. And it, it, it's kind of neat when you, when you get up one length of the, uh, the garage and you look back and you see this horde of zombies just coming through, mauling <laughs> through people. That's just, that's, that's satisfying. There's a certain cathartic power. <laughs> The, the other part of this level is the promenade. There's like, it's, it's two sections, right? There's a garage area and then there's a promenade. And the promenade was just basically, the idea is it's this long um, outdoor mall of stores and shops and movie theaters and, you know, the entertainment sec section of Punch Bowl. Um, and what's, what I always thought was cool about the promenade is it has a slow upward progress to it. So you eventually get to this point where there's this ramp fight. And the ramp fight in there, um, we actually initiates from our, one of our old demo levels when we were first trying to shop the game around. Um, we had this, a lot of it was based on this whole um, taking of a bridge. And I took the idea of that, that we had in that demo level because it just seemed so cool and, and built it up into the fight that's, that's in the mall right now. And you know, once you got people coming in, delivering things with cars and, and uh, all kinds of folks shooting at you. And, and this is the last time you, you see the, the police. So every, every police character in the game, except for, uh, um, except for the chief, is in, this, is in the garage and in the prominent section of the garage. 
Okay, um, this is Alan Turner again, and we're looking at ACE, um, the mall fight. The, I guess the official name is A60 mall fight, but it's, this used to be a portion of the mall, and um, the mall got so huge that we wound up having to chop this off and develop it uh, by itself into a, a brand new level. Uh, I'm Chris Cobb. I'm one of the artists here at Wide Load. I came in on the end of this level and polished it up, tried to get it looking good for the kids at home. <laughs> uh, when uh, Chris says he polished it up, though, he, he's not lying. This thing looked terrible for a very long time. It was, like I say, it, it was chopped off from the mall and didn't quite know what was going to happen with it since a whole lot of the things that were introduced to the mall got chopped with it. So we had to find ways to, to uh, make it look interesting. Um, to keep the frame rate down, which Chris did a wonderful job of, of, of making that happen, because before it was a, at a point where you would come into this huge open space and it would just crawl. You know, have you got anything to say about that, this big? Uh, yeah, basically I think it was just uh, cut in half. I think he used to be able to run all the way around the thing. Right. And uh, so basically this is a, it's a U-shape now and it's all elbowed off, unlike many of our other levels. Um, so yeah. Uh. So in, um, in that this was initially part of uh, the mall, it was originally the introduction of the militia. And the militia were going to be introduced midway through the mall when they were going to be fighting with cops and, and all kinds of other crazy things. And there was going to be like this, this neat little three-way fight. and. The, uh, it, it just wound up not being, being a practical thing for us to do in the course of, of uh, developing those levels. So here we, we, we just toss you right in with the, the militia. You uh, find out about them a little bit through their dialogue, a little bit through um, what's going on with Otis and, uh, and um, the, uh, the big guy, the boss at the end of it. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what to say. This is, this is not necessarily one of my favorite levels, but it's one that I really, uh, towards the end of the, the process, started to dig just because it looked good. I mean, even, even though some of the play were, wasn't what I wanted to be, the, the visuals here were so cool that I found myself just wanting to sit back and hang out and look at the water spouts and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the skies. This did turn out to be one of, one of my favorite levels. Um, it, yeah, I don't know. It just it just turned out all right. It, when I got it, it was uh, pretty barren, but I just threw in some those little grass uh, median type things, and you know threw some trees in. It's always easy to spice up an environment with a bunch of organic plant life. Um, every mall's got to have the the spouting water fountains, so those add some nice atmosphere to it. So we. Uh the interior went through a, a bunch of different versions as well. There was initially a, a long dungeon crawl in like in these low stores before you got to that central atrium area. And we this just decided that the atrium area was so much more impressive and so much more entertaining to, to uh, fight through than any of the other stuff there. So I think we just make this whole level into a level of vistas. So you've got this big out, outside area where you, you can see as, as, as far as you can see. And then when you get inside, you're, you've got this, this scope that you look up, you see the sky, and you see everything else around you. And it, it was a, a real hassle with the portals trying to make all that, that work, but I, th I think it came out pretty well. There's the, the boss fight, which um, came out pretty, you know, it came out pretty interesting. It came out pretty well. It, it was um, initially a, a fight that involved a, a lot more zombies and a lot more animations than um, we necessarily had the time for it, so we had, we had to, to, to cut a few corners, but I think the corners we, we cut wound up making this really tasty. Once we added the, the music that's in the background when you're fighting, uh, when you're fighting Jumbo, it, before it was just this very dry, open air, Jumbo's yelling at you uh, as, as he's chopping at you, and then um, Alex came to me and said, hey, hey, why don't you add in the banjo music? And I did it, and wham, it became this hilarious fight with a man with a chainsaw, something didn't think I would ever see <laughs> anywhere. As far as my part in this, I just uh, went in, tried to spice it up a bit, tried to, you know, we have a difficult mix of uh, past and future 
with a lot of these levels. So it takes place in the late 50s, uh, but a lot of it's supposed to look futuristic. So uh, took a few different elements of the interior of the mall here and just tried to spice them up with the little walkways and the the uh, escalator type things looking kind of flashy and futuristic. But then a lot of it with the concrete walls and everything looks, I think, pretty pretty uh, old school, I guess. So it's a it's a it's an unusual combination, but I think it works better in this level than well, it works pretty well in this level, I think. When I uh, first was trying to figure out what this atrium should look like, I wound up walking around in a bunch of uh, levels, not levels, I'm sorry, a, a bunch of malls here in Chicago. And I, f I think the one that inspired this the most was probably the w uh, Water Tower Plaza here. Um, just because you, you, there's this wonderful central elevator thing that they have going on. And you've got these, he these big round walkways that let you look, look up and down. And it, the, 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 ov the overpasses and the, uh, the, the overhangs very much uh, mimic what's going on in that. And if you ever come get a chance to come to Chicago, you, know, you should definitely go check out that mall, but don't go looking for any zombies in it. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I also thought, we didn't talk about this, but I also t uh, thought of the water tower when working on this. I, there's a part right when you enter where you're going up these escalators and there's these little water fountains that shoot these little like globs of water and I always try to catch them. So uh, once again, we've got the, the water fountains inside here. I couldn't quite pull that off, but we've got some fountain sprays inside here. Those are always fun. I'm Doug Sartman. I'm the level designer for the level known to me only as B10 Farmhouse. I guess the, uh, the real title will come at some future date. And I am Matt Sell, who wrote this stuff. Yes, for what it's worth. Yes. Uh, first thing you notice uh, in this level is the corn. Yeah, this is a remarkably, uh, remarkably well-farmed corn farm. Uh, for a dilapidated farmhouse. For, for a rabble of a militia. Yes, for a farm that isn't even supposed to be a corn farm. <laughs> Run by a nutcase. Yes. Yes, yes, corn. And there's actually a very good reason for that that you'll discover someday. Do tell. Oh. <laughs> so this isn't that day, huh? No, no. <laughs> I actually, uh, I first came up with the idea of using corn as a a way to uh, hide and, and be able to fight this huge militia force. <coughs> uh, I knew I wanted to use machine guns. Uh, and I actually did a little research into um, heavy machine gun penetration into cornfields, or at least tried to. I uh, realized pretty quickly that uh, that's a, a field of scholarship that is remarkably, <laughs> remarkably uh, uh, little, little served. Plus, you have to pay for that corn after you shoot it up, and that's right. We we don't have that kind of money, to be yeah. totally honest. Certainly, academia doesn't. Yeah, but uh, I'm pretty pleased with with how it worked out. Um, it doesn't completely hide you. <clears throat> if you're standing in the middle of one of the open rows, uh, the the militia can see you and, and will shoot at you. Uh, but overall, it gives you a lot of cover from their sight. The other thing you notice uh, right off the bat is these scarecrows. I don't know how many people notice uh, their first playthrough that the scarecrow looks, or is supposed to look, a lot like stubs. Is there a reason for that, Doug? The player will have to decide for themselves <laughs> why, <laughs> why the scarecrow might possibly look something like uh, Edward Stubblefield. There was also originally uh, supposed to be uh, a bit of a little mini challenge in these cornfields where you were you would pose as a scarecrow to avoid uh, detection. That's right, the idea was that uh, you'd be able to knock over one of these scarecrows, <coughs> get up on the base, uh, and assume a scarecrow pose, uh, and then the militia would not be able to see you, because you would be such a startling, uh, uh, you, know, you would bear such a startling resemblance to the scarecrow. Um, once we had the corn all implemented and working, uh, we realized that the you know, putting a lot of work into making the scarecrow thing uh, function was pointless because you get plenty of cover just in the fields. Um, so in the end, we decided not to do that. Coming up to the uh, sheep pen here. Ah, uh, the sheep pen. Yeah. What? What? Uh, what can we tell people about the sheep? 
Well, uh, the militia are enamored of sheep. Well, who isn't? They're so gosh darn cute. The militia don't care about much, but they care about the sheep. Sheep, uh, just as a side note, have actually been an important <laughs> role. <laughs> they actually had an important role in uh, the Stubb storyline for several iterations. Uh, even before the... Even before the farm, there was a uh, there was a plan for Stubbs to have a, a little sheep sidekick, and for that sidekick to play a role. Uh, we we got rid of that pretty quickly, just because the things I had written into the script for the sheep to do were just insane. Uh, but the sheep live on here in the farm, and uh, they do play a role. Perha perhaps even beyond the farm. Yes, the sheep are uh, a key way of getting past one particular obstacle. Just look at those suckers run. Isn't that ah. the cutest thing? Don't you just want to pick them up and snuggle? You can't really blame the militiamen. No, no. Pretty little faces. If loving sheep is wrong... <laughs> I don't want to be right. <laughs> Uh, this is also, uh, this level features the first and perhaps only uh, appearance of the Impala, not to be confused with a similarly named automobile, which probably has some sort of trademark on it. I'm sure they wouldn't mind. <laughs> I think we're safe. Yeah, this... Uh, I know everyone is, once they, they drive the tractor, they think, why can't we have a tractor-on-tractor -tractor duel? And the answer is that it isn't, we tried that, and it wasn't really very fun. It's just more fun to stick people. Yeah. With the skewering and such. Yes. For those of you who've been wondering why uh, Otis Monday lives on a farm called Knob Cheese Farm, uh, there's actually a... Uh, convoluted bit of backstory I won't get into very deeply here. You mean a rich and well-developed backstory? Yes, a rich and well-developed backstory uh, about Otis Monday and his uh, prior existence and how he came into possession of the farm uh, after his lengthy and bitter rivalry with the Knob family. Uh, a feud, one might even call it. They had their own militia, didn't they? Uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's a knob militia. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a long story. <laughs> Coming soon in novel form. Yeah. Not really. So at one point in the game, you, uh, <laughs> hopefully, you enter the barn. Yeah, if you don't enter the barn, the rest of the game's going to be really dull. It's just going to be you standing in that farm yard crying. Originally, uh, this was simply going to be an assault on a farmhouse. Um, you know, basically zombies are just on the verge uh, of the house and it's a long, drawn out, Night of the Living Dead style uh, assault on the house and then fighting through the house. <clears throat> I, uh, I gradually expanded that. Or rather, I'm not sure how it, how it eventually turned into an entire farm. Um, there was a lot, I originally set it up where there was a farmhouse with layers of defenses around it. Um, and I was trying to set up a pretty open-ended uh, open thing where you could assault the machine gun nests first or you could sneak through trenches, etc. cetera. Um, that later proved, I was, I was discouraged from actually pursuing that uh, that particular design, um, simply because players need need some direction. They need they need uh, to be told uh, pretty clearly you know, what they have to do next. And you gonna they, take they that need from some him, players? Indication. <laughs> they need some indication. You fools um, need some indication of what to do next. And my original implementation of the house surrounded by defenses really really didn't have that. So. So this, this uh, level gradually became more and more linear 
with the uh, defenses being presented uh, you know, more sequentially. Um, it's still a lovely pastoral romp. I mean, it's, you, get to see, uh, you get to destroy a whole farm. Oh, yeah. I mean, haven't you always I'm, wanted I'm to do pretty, that in a game? Pretty pleased with how it worked out. Yeah. Actually, it, I mean, it was weird. I, uh, when we were originally trying to come up with the uh, story for this, uh, I, I never anticipated that we would leave Punchbowl. I always figured we would put you in this one setting and, uh, and keep you there. And I figured that Punchbowl being what it was, there were plenty of opportunities for us to, to make everything interesting. And there are. Uh, one of the things that people kept saying was, oh, well, we got to do some sort of, you know, zombie versus farmhouse level. And uh, that was just, I mean, even from the very beginning when we were coming up with concept art, one of the first things uh, Mark Bernal, our artist, did was mock up a shot of Stubbs assaulting a farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's actually, it, I... I'm really sort of happy that we have it. Uh, it, it worked out really well, and I, I kind of like the idea, the, the break that it gives you from, uh, you know, you get to enter Punch Bowl and, and have some fun there in the first third, and then in the second third of the game, you, uh, you take a little walk outside, see that there's a, a bigger world, and uh, then in the third third of the game, you. You go back <laughs> you, to you finish the job. That's right. So we, uh, we make reference during a cutscene in this uh, barn to a famous movie. If you're very young or just culturally illiterate... Like certain you, members of this development uh, certain, team. <laughs> certain members of the wide load staff <laughs> didn't recognize the movie we were referring to. Not going to name names, <coughs> oh, Christopher. Mm. Uh, but uh, but yes, this was actually. I think Doug's original idea was to have a sort of uh, a Braveheart speech, and, and the the classic rallying the troops before the big assault. And I uh, I twisted that into the Patton speech uh, for a couple reasons. One because it's not a Scottish zombie, and. Uh, I just loved the idea, the, the iconography of, of Stubbs in front of the American flag uh, rallying his, his undead minions. Uh, one thing you may not notice, uh, one thing we've wondered whether we should explain to you, is the... Uh, you'll notice the flag on the door of the barn has two stars crossed off. And that is because Otis Monday refuses to acknowledge Hawaii and Alaska as states. Now you know. And knowing is half the battle. Boy, I hope that isn't trademarked. And who's the voice actor on that uh, particular speech? No one knows. No one knows. No one knows. Man it just of mystery. <laughs> Brian knows. Brian's about to mysteriously disappear. <laughs> <laughs> well, whoever he is, he did a bang-up job. Stubbs actually, uh, yeah, his, uh, his performance here was the stuff of legend. One of the amazing things about this farm is the incredible, uh, incredible stability of the hay bales as compared to the doors. Yes. They sure knew how to pack a mean <laughs> hay bale at this farm. And you know, funny thing about those hay bales, uh, when we first got the hay bale uh, scenery object uh, from, from the artist who did the first pass on the model, um, the, it was strapped wrong. The, uh, the straps went around the middle like an equator instead of instead of having two straps around the, uh, the long end, as it is. And to me, this looked totally wrong. I worked in a stable uh, for part of one summer as a kid, and I knew what a hay bale looks like, and, and it looked just ridiculous and wrong to me. Uh, and I had to fight to get that changed. Alex didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Uh, he was like, no, we're not spending the time to change the straps on the hay bale. But I'm glad we did.
Do you see the sacrifices that Doug makes for you, the player? Fought for, look at that. You would have had a subpar hay bale experience were it not The fun. realism of this world would have been completely blown. That's true. This is no farm. That's why we licensed the hay bale engine. Yes. Well, actually, one thing I want to say is that uh, this is probably the, the one level where you get to hear Otis the most, uh, which is a good thing, I suppose. Uh, Otis does get, uh, get to deliver a little more of his, uh, his worldview, which is, which is unique. I guess it is a worldview, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. It's a, it's a, what do the Germans call it? A Weltanschauung? Or... Yes, and uh, Otis, Otis would probably shoot you for even saying that. But yeah, the, so yeah, the, he uh, covers all the bases. <laughs> yeah, well, the not not quite all of them. The I think the rest will be covered in his forthcoming uh, novel. Yeah, or his manifesto. I guess. Yeah, it's it's going to be on the same shelf as as you know Ann Coulter and Al Franken. Yeah. Uh, but will be less lucid than either. <laughs> uh, one of the best parts of developing a game is is when the game starts surprising you, mm -hmm. uh, when things that you've you've done uh, combine in some weird way that you didn't expect, and uh, and it's sort of shocking and delightful at the same time. And definitely, I, I think combat dialogue for me is is one of the, the things that. Uh, tends to combine itself in, in weird and unusual ways that sometimes work far better than I could have ever expected. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite moments during development was when uh, there was a, a test level we made and there were two police officers chasing stubs and the cops were rather trigger happy at that point. They'd fire at anything, through anything, including each other, uh, just to get to you. And so two cops were chasing me, and uh, one of them fired point-blank range into the back of his friend. And his friend turned around and stared at the, the gunman who said, it wasn't me. Uh, and I've told that story a billion times, and I, I've told it better every other time. <laughs> uh, what I, I guess the one I love the most is the brilliant understatement uh, of the medium militia uh, when you shoot or rip off one or both of his arms and <laughs> he says that ain't good <laughs> I'm Alex Ropian project director Stubbs I'm Christopher MacArthur a programmer yeah Christopher and I basically did this damn level together I, I, I kinda did a first pass and then uh, Christopher picked up all my mess and made it good Originally, in the beginning here, there was that tour bot kind of gives you a, a tour of this area of the dam, and uh, the robots hit on her and stuff. <laughs> we, we took out of some of the her dialogue because it was just you know robots get in the way can of be kind of chatty. Yeah, a little they? too chatty. Yeah. Got in the way of some of the fighting sounds. There's a, how many lines of dialogue would you estimate there is in the combat dialogue? There's a lot of combat dialogue. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> I don't know. I remember we had to take some lines out of the robots because uh, there's like eight robots and they each have uh, they each have a full set of triggers or 75 megs worth of combat dialogue for the robots alone. And that's not even their special case dialogue for certain areas. So I think this is the first time you ever encounter these shotgun scientists. The boomstick guys. Boomsticks. And originally I wanted to do something cool with them in here where you would burn their faces off with like hot steam but <laughs> we got concerned with the uh, amount of particles in this room, and so we kind of just made it a cool fight. But, and it's kind of moved that into the next water rooms, which have, are less particle intensive. So, it's the first time you fight these, both kinds of scientists, actually. Yeah, so instead of doing the burning off their faces with steam, we did sort of a little optional choke them with gas in this room which is you, you have all these, these vents on the, on the ceiling and blowing the fresh air into this room, but once you turn them all off, the room fills with the poisonous gas. And they choke to death. 
and this is the, the first level where you, you use your, your whiz as a real mechanic. Yeah. Yeah. So originally, we, this actually, the dam is the combination of, of two levels that we designed early on. One was, was um, uh, uh, taint the reservoir, where the whole idea of it was to fight your way to the reservoir and then to just take a big old pee in it. Um, and then the other level was breaking this huge dam. That, that's an, another, we had this, we've had these ideas where we want the zombies to, to break stuff in the environment. So we had this crazy idea that you would, you know, bust a whole dam. So we kind of combined those two in this one level. And uh, the, the pee battle is really, the idea behind that is, is basically, it's just a solo game of King of the Hill where you have to be in the hill. And yeah. Everybody's coming at you. And, and the P was just kind of a, a cool mechanic to, to force you to, to stay on the hill to, to actually solve it. And it's just funny. I mean, a zombie taking a whiz. I liked peeing on the, the cops. That's my, my <laughs> highlight is peeing on the cops and, and making them fall into the water. It's, yeah. yeah, actually, I remember the first, actually this was in here for a while. In order to make the P work, it had to come out of a model, I guess. And so I remember Seeger stuck the gut grenade model. I think that's still on there. So, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it probably won't be by the time <laughs> we play this. But if you spin the camera around, you know, the gut grenade was hanging out of Stubbs' pants. It looks pretty gross. It, it is, uh, yeah, a horrific picture of zombie wang. So I kind of designed these areas also with there's a lot of robots in the beginning and they kind of ignore you and just go about their business and work on things but I I try to make them patrol right through the firefights so that a scientist will accidentally hit a robot with a shot or two and then he'll freak out and go lost in space on you. <laughs> so they, they won't get in, into the mix with you unless they actually take the damage. So This is kind of a cool area now because it's one of, the, one of the ones in the game where you get to choose how you want to beat it. Um, you could come here from the very beginning and watch that guy go in there and just possess someone and, and just, you know, they won't even know you're a bad guy and just walk right in there and open it. You can be stealthy with the hand and walk through the vent or you can fight, you can do Rambo on it and just fight your way through it. So it's kind of cool that you kind of get to choose how you want to play the game right there. Yeah, there's, there's actually, there's a bunch of, of like air ducts and vents in the game that you, you don't have to use, but they're there. Um, good reason to go back and visit some areas. I also liked the, in this area where you get to see the zombies behind the glass, banging on the glass. It kind of reminded me of uh, the new Dawn of the Dead where the zombies are banging on the mall uh, glass and you just see them through there, or Alien Resurrection where they, they have them trapped behind the glass and right. they, they kind of just beat their way out, stubs, lets them loose and havoc is, ensues. I'm Alex Teropian, project director, Stubbs. And I'm Patrick Curry, the lead designer in Stubbs. And uh, we're here to talk about the level that we internally call a fender. And uh, I, I forget what it's actually called in the game, but it's the fourth to last level in the game. It's the level where Stubbs comes back to Punch Bowl after uh, destroying the dam, and uh, he finds that it's populated with the army. So this is the first level with the, you fight the army guys. Yeah, yeah, it's the first level with the army guys. And the army guys are cool because they have all these awesome weapons and uh, like their combat rifle, uh, and then a sniper rifle, and a bazooka. So the army is a whole lot of fun to possess and use their weapons, so we specifically designed this level to be pretty rough and to require you to possess lots of guys to actually get through it. We, we like to think we're doing unique stuff here at the load, and we're, people ask us like where we get ideas from, and we're always talking about how we'd like to do stuff that's different, we'll probably never make a World War II shooter. This, this is our World War II shooter right here. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's definitely a little bit of a Castle Wolfenstein in here. Yeah, the army guys, are, it's, they're like the first serious enemy you fight. I mean, they're just, they're all the enemies are, you know, they're enemies and they have, a, I think, a nice sort of curve to the way they ramp in difficulty. But, like, the cops are really, like, they're, they're sort of like, you know, they're, they're all the cops that, like, left their tough beats and came to Punch Bowl because they thought it was going to be a cakewalk and they were just going to, like, sit around eating donuts and then once the zombies show up, they're like, oh, crap! And then the militia are just, like, you know, they're just nuts and out of control. They're old geezers and the scientists right. are just kooky brainiacs. And so the army guys are the first guys that are trained killers. And uh, 
I think it shows in the difficulty of this level and the later level with the, with the Army guys. Yeah, Fender's got some stuff that's only on a Fender, too. Well, I guess landmines are show up a little later, too. But land, you, you experience landmines for the first time here, which is kind of funny because um, you can totally use your zombies to run through a field of landmines and you get this kind of crazy chain reaction where guys blow up into the air and they fall back down on landmines and blow up again and that's pretty funny. Yeah, the landmines was actually one of the very first things I ever thought of that would be fun to do with the zombies, you know, because you have your zombies and you want to be able to use them for things like the meat shield is real obvious, you know, you use that in a lot of the levels. And just to be clear, there's nothing funny about a landmine. There's not, really. Except uh, to see guys bounce between three of them. That's right. And uh, so the the landmines are one of the things I really wanted you to be able to use your zombies for, is to clear out the minefields. You know, you can shove a zombie in there. Uh, but then also another thing that is uh, an offender is you can use your zombies here. Actually, you have to use your zombies to knock down some of the big walls. The the army's shown up and they've set up these barricades protecting uh, kind of key choke points in the city. And so you have to get enough zombies over there to, to knock down the walls and wanted to kind of give you a feeling of being Stubbs the uber zombie, right, making yeah. your minions do stuff. Yeah, that was like one of, one of the f initial core ideas was this, uh, this notion that uh, s zombies have above average like super strength and especially Stubbs who's, you know, king zombie. Um, but uh, we, we didn't have the, we weren't going to make the whole environment destructible because that poses a whole bunch of just crazy design problems but um, we have a we have a few ways in which Stubbs and his zombies uh, really affect the environment and we build some gameplay around them uh, one of them is is uh, breaking through and killing through doors and windows if you've gotten this far you've probably eaten got eaten dudes through windows on the farm um, that's where we yeah. first implemented that and then there's a couple of like, you know, big encounters in a fender where you have to knock down these big walls, and that's the whole idea that you can, you know, you would send your zombies off to like destroy some part of the environment, almost like a boss battle against the environment. Yeah, there's no uber characters in the army. Um, I mean, there's the sniper rifle guy and the bazooka guy. They're kind of like mini bosses, but there's no super leader, and so the the environment in this level in City Hall are really the boss. You know, it's this totally trashed out punch bowl that has all kinds of obstacles, whether it's, you know, crashed cars or giant barricades of collapsed buildings. So it, it was a lot of fun to think about what the city would be like after the zombie invasion. Hi, I'm Alan Turner again, and we're here to, t I'm a designer here at White Load and we're here to talk about the lab level. Uh, this is Matt Sell, sitting here with Alan, talking about the lab. Uh, those of you who aren't scientists might not recognize the giant statue that we have in our, uh, our lobby here. Yep, methane. <laughs> Sim symb symbolizing the power of Stubbs duodenum. That's right. It's all full of hidden meanings, kids. You'll never find them all, but you can try. <laughs> so, um, actually, since we're talking about the lab, maybe we can get uh, Matt here to tell us a little more about Dr. Y, since this, this whole level is built around just leading you up to an encounter with Dr. Y. Right. So, Dr. Y uh, was actually sort of a... Uh, latecomer to the whole story. Uh, not really late, but in all the iterations of the story, we, we, we didn't always have him. Uh, and he was actually sort of hard to pin down as a character, uh, but he is, he ended up being this uh, uh, cross sort of between uh, the absent-minded professor and Dr. Mengele. Uh, he's he's <laughs> this sort of uh, guy who, who he's not really evil. He's not a bad guy. He just I call him ethically challenged. You know, he he just doesn't feel that there's anything he he can't or should not do in the pursuit of advancing science. Right. He's the, the traditional crazy scientist you see in 
a lot of the old pulp fiction where, where they bring havoc onto the world not because they, they mean to do it, just because they're too damn curious for their own good. Right, yeah, so one of the challenges with the scientists in general was we didn't want them to do the same thing that everybody else had. Um, you know, not more guns and pistols and batons and all that craziness. But we did want you, we wanted you to get two, um, we wanted to get two things across. One was that they are the source of most of the weapons and scientific oddities that you see in the course of the game and that they've still got things hidden away that, that you haven't seen yet. Um, we wound up actually introducing them earlier than we had anticipated. They're supposed to be um, only in the, the lab and they wound up being pushed back to the, was it the, the dam? Were they first seen? Uh, I think maybe even the greenhouse. Yes, that's right. In the greenhouse was second level. But uh, the, the deal was is they, we wanted to give them weapons that kind of represented the, the time period, right? So they've got these crazy ray guns that shoot this crazy fat ray. And the, the, the beams and the ray guns are kind of inspired by the, uh, the beams in the Forbidden Planet. And, uh, there's a point where, where they're shooting at the id monster and there's just like these, these, these kind of stupid obviously drawn in laser beams that in their own way look kind of cool. So we, we figured that that's, that would be the basis for the, the stuff that we have. At the same time, there's a, there's a certain liquid nature to, uh, to the beams that, 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 that gives them this kind of etheric science um, thing going on. So they're, they're not lasers in the traditional sense of uh, what we would think of nowadays. They're like this fat, fantastic laser blast that, that splatters and sprays and whatnot. Um, there's also the, the, the boom gun, and the, the boom gun is the, that weapon that shoots these, this string of rings. And what's neat about that was that it was the, the first weapon that actually was, um, well actually the only weapon where you could actually manipulate someone. Uh, with, 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 with that you could push things back and push them up against the wall and then move them to places you wanted to, um, them to go. And so when you're fighting with them on the dam, you can, you know, Pick, pick a guy up, <clears throat> throw him over the edge of the dam. And I think it was ultimately that weapon that got them spread out um, to a couple other levels in the game. Um, but what makes this a little more deadly than it, it is in other places is that the spaces that you have to fight people in are much tighter than they are in the dam. So you are for, you're forced into these, these really close, count, these close quarters um, fights where what seemed like a small irritation before of a guy who's shooting you here and there becomes this extreme irritation because if you, if you leave, leave them long, long enough, some of them will go berserk and just hold down the trigger and, and the, the guys with the blue lasers would, would just rail you. Another thing, there's actually two classes of scientists. You can uh, hear the difference in the audio actually. The, the uh, head scientists, so to speak, are the ones with the British accent and the uh, assistant scientists are the ones who have that sort of uh, lab monkey weirdo Peter Lorre quality to their voice. Uh, and, the, the, and the other ones also shoot the pink ray. That's true. And the blue rays are the, are the lead scientists. Um, For all you train spotters out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was also um, on the, one of the levels that inspired the idea that, that the robots are, were an environmental enemy. That they're, they initially don't attack you directly um, they're just kind of there to help you out, but as soon as they take damage, they flip out and start to attack anything and everything in sight. Which makes them um, kind of cool in, in, these, in these close quarters fights because you get a, if you know there's a robot in the area, you can hurt a robot and run and know they, he'll tear up um, the, the scientist and the scientist will have to shoot him. And he explodes and you take out robot scientists, um, everything else in sight. The battle with Dr. Y, however, the, the idea was to take all the weapons that, that, that you've met with the, the scientists and take them up a notch. So his, the, 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 the main crazy blaster that he shoots, that red ray, is um, just an extension of the, ray, the red ray that the, the assistant scientists use. And the, the, uh, the big knockback ray that he, that he fires um, to push you away from this, the, the central obelisk thing is just an extension of, of the boom gun. But what's, what's What's, what's makes, what makes them cool and different is the fact that they're continuous. So they're much more like the, the inspiration for both those beams is sort of like the, ray, the death ray from the old um, World, George Powell War of the Worlds where 
the beam is just like this continuous blast of pain and devastation and destruction. And I think that, that worked out pretty well. One of, the, uh, one of the things you may have noticed as you're playing through the game is that there's, there's not a whole lot of diversity in punch bowl. And uh, when you get to that boss battle with Dr. Y, that's actually sort of explained uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the, the, the only thing that's missing in a, a perfect city is a, a perfect citizenry. And so Dr. Y creates it for his boss. Um, and that's why you don't really have to feel terribly bad about eating all these brains. So if that's been gnawing at any of you, you can, you can, you can just put that fear aside. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like to think of the lab as the thing that emphasizes the nature of, of this zombie versus the rest of the city. That in the stubs is, is in some essence a, a creature of the wild brought, brought out to get rid of this death-like stasis that's in this. Uh, that's holding on to the city. I mean, everything is, you know, they're making a perfect citizen, it's a perfect world, everything is clean, everything is precise, everything is exactly as someone wants it to be and, 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 and would stay that way unless Stubbs came in and, and juiced it up a little bit for us. That's true. I actually, I've, I've spoken about this elsewhere, but uh, one of the big inspirations story-wise for Stubbs was Poe's The Mask of the Red Death. And one of the things that I, I think uh, Stubbs, the zombie, owes to that is just the idea of uh, a person who, who tries to build a wall big enough to keep all the chaos out. And he can't. There's, there's just no way of doing it. Uh, but unlike, uh, unlike Mask of the Red Death, which is just straightforward tragedy, uh, we, we try to look at it sort of from the Red Death's point of view and see what a party it would be. Uh, there's, uh, there's something to be said here. I, I don't know that I, I really want to go into a lot of detail about my uh, deepest satirical thoughts, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there, there, there is a point to all of this, and it's a subtle point, and you don't even have to see that it's there to enjoy the game, but uh, there it is if you want it. Now, I also have to comment that one of the, the greatest satisfactions in this game, for me, is walking through the sterile areas of this laboratory and just having these terrible, bloody fights that leave it just covered in, in, in gore and chaos. And, and in, in a weird way, it's, it becomes more alive once everything is dead <laughs> than it did when um, everything was alive. And again, that's uh, another comment on, on just the nature of the themes that, that this game is trying to, to explore. Stubbs is the only real person in this city, and he decorates oddly, but Effect. with a certain <laughs> with, yeah, with a certain style and panache, all his own. All right, I'm uh, Doug Zartman. I'm the level designer for uh, the level known to us as C40 City Hall. All right, I am Chris Cobb. I'm one of uh, one of the level artists that worked on this level as well as a few others throughout the game. This is a level that uh, went through many, many iterations. Uh, when I began this, I was uh, looking forward to creating this entire city uh, overrun by zombies, full of tanks, full of, full of the army, having these giant battles. Uh, and so I actually designed it that way. Um, this was originally uh, about ten times larger uh, than it is now. Which is pretty amazing because it's still very, very large. Yeah, the, the sight lines are just ridiculous. Um, so there's this continual process of, uh, you know, chopping it down and then blocking off streets and, and uh, you know, making it much more uh, manageable. Yes, it's quite an effort keeping designers uh, in check. That's right. This kind of thing. Neat thing about this, this level is that this is the first uh, first one where you're, you're spending a lot of time uh, in vehicles, uh, not just vehicles, but, but tanks that uh, can actually do a lot of damage. Um, so the, the long straight streets uh, certainly uh, you know, were, are conducive to, to that. It was sort of tricky because a lot of this was uh, a lot of the vehicle action and encounters were designed before uh, 
uh, Chris came in and actually messed up the streets, which <laughs> made the vehicles stop uh, stop working half the time. Right. Well, uh, yeah, that was my job to come in and put some huge craters in the ground. But I think uh, they actually some of our we had got some happy accidents out of them with uh, things like jumping the jeep off of the uh, big craters. Yeah, exactly. And taking shelter in the craters against fire. Um, I didn't really design a whole lot of places where you could hide uh, in these streets, and so the craters uh, were, were a great addition for that. So uh, yeah, as Doug was saying, I think this is the first level where you actually get to see the tank. Um, is that true? Um, you see it right at the end of uh, a fender. Okay. Well, definitely the first level you where you get to drive the tank. Drive it. That's right. Yeah. Um, pretty. The tank was quite an undertaking. I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, yeah, getting all the the treads to work accurately and all that was was a pretty big deal. Hopefully, you can actually see it. You can't see uh, a lot of the underworkings of it a whole lot when you're actually driving it, but when the AIs are driving it around, hopefully, you'll get to see some of that. So that turned out pretty cool, I think. Hopefully, it'll be fun to drive around and do some damage. All right, so this is the uh, the approach to the interior of the city hall level. Um, yeah, when I first got my hands on this, <laughs> it was en enormous. It's still pretty big, but it was a good three times larger than it is now. And if what I've heard is true, it used to be even bigger than that. Yeah. So that's that's uh, quite amazing. But it, I think we still maintained a pretty good size here. So it's a good little backdrop for the tank battle here the early stages of, of placing AIs on this uh, level and you know, setting up fights. I was constantly like changing the fog, you know, bringing in the fog <laughs> closer and closer and closer to try to get, keep the frame rate uh, decent, but portals took care of that. All right, all right. So yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of landscaping went on here. A lot of, uh, we got rid of some, we had, used to have two statues in here. One of them was a bit uh, phallic, so we got rid of that one, um, put in Nice big Monday statue to properly enhance his ego, right in the middle. Um, yeah, we couldn't have anything obscene in this game. You know? no, absolutely no, no innuendo. No, we were uh, this classy right. game, classy yeah. game here. Yeah. So, yeah, high road all the way. So the good thing about it being big is that even when it, it when it is full full of scenery, uh, you know, and things that can can block your vehicle, uh, it's still big enough you can get around and, and find some paths. Uh, right. I was worried when I. I put in some of the slight elevation changes here. I was a bit concerned that the tank wouldn't be able to navigate in there very well, but it seems to seems to do okay. Getting Even up and the down. Eyes are usually pretty good. All right. Following their move points. Yeah, I think if anything, it makes it a lot more interesting terrain to navigate. We went back and forth and back and forth on uh, just how well armored the tanks are, because of course when you're fighting it on foot. You know, you're fighting it with grenades and, and the flatulence and, you know, not much else. Uh, and so we had to make it possible to kill the tank in a reasonable amount of time uh, when you're on foot. But then when you're in a tank yourself, uh, you know, that, that level of armor meant that, you know, you could kill the, kill the thing with two shots, sometimes one shot. So there's, there's a lot of trickery going on uh, behind the scenes to make, to, uh, you know, make the tank stronger when you're fighting them with a tank. Then on foot. Right, which is, which is I'm sure difficult because you want the tanks to feel very powerful. Yeah. But uh, so that's a tough balance there. I'm Doug Zartman. I'm the level designer for C50 End, the interior of the city hall. And I'm Matt Sell, still the writer. The city hall is the last holdout for Monday and his cronies. The, the, this is also the level where the various uh, secrets are revealed dark dark monday family secrets things only a monday would know mm. and not even andrew monday knows some of that surprise as much of a surprise to him as it is to you yes this is a level where our promise that this is a love story uh is actually fulfilled I mean, you do see... Or at least see, our claim. Yeah. <laughs> love story is. Well, no, I mean, you see Stubbs earlier sort of swooning, and this is the level where he, uh, he makes good on that swoon. 
everything between the greenhouse and now has just been a, an attempt really to get closer to Maggie. <laughs>